Hello and welcome to the first webinar in the 2017 Organic Seed Production Webinar Series presented by the Organic Seed Alliance and the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture. This is your host, Alice Formiga of the eOrganic community at eExtension. You can find all eOrganic articles, videos, and recorded webinars on organic farming and research on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The presentation will last about an hour and then we'll have about 30 minutes for your questions. So today, we are very glad to welcome back Michaela Colley and Jared Zeistro, who conduct organic seed education programming with the Organic Seed Alliance. We also welcome Leah Atwood and Ana Galvis Martinez of the Multinational Exchange for Sustainable Agriculture, also known as MESA, who will be discussing their organic seed internship program and its accessibility for Spanish speaking participants. So, with that, I'm going to hand things over to our first presenter, Leah Atwood. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Leah Atwood. I'm the Director of Programs and Partnerships at MESA. And we're excited to share with you a little bit about this new program that we started last year. And this is um, its a unique program that is really combining on-farm practical learning with online education and uh, in within a, a network model. And so I wanna share with you just about the, the organic seed internship and how it connects to the online course. So this is, it's a six month program and it is self-directed in the sense that anyone that's interested in participating in the internship, whether you are a farm that you, and you want to pass on your knowledge to beginning organic seed producers, or you are a beginning farmer wanting to learn about organic seed production, you can fill out an application online. And this is, it's a pretty short application and it is just, it outlines what you're interested in or what your farm is about and what you want, what the internship will be offering. And then it's self-directed in that you can, you take the initiative to match with each other. But the information on the website shows you, um, it shows you what your, what someone is offering and what can really match your expectations. And um, we will share those links in uh, later, I think, in this presentation. Um, but this, this screen that you're on right now, it shows the, the online course sign-up sheet. And this is the, the homepage for the online seed course. And so if you go to this course, you can, um, there is a, a link on this page to sign up for the internship program. Um, and the, core, the online course component, we built this. Um, this was designed by Organic Seed Alliance. And this offers different materials, readings and webinars, and a, for, a new forum this year that can really help um, take the hands-on component of the internship and bring in the you know, theoretical and the academic um, additions and this is it covers everything from seed production to market um, to some of the politics of um, of the food system in with a uh, focus on seeds and um, this is something that we so this is our second year offering this and the last year if you there might be some people on the webinar that participated last year um, last year was much more of self was self directed, and this year there's going to be more engagement in terms of responding to the forums. And we really are wanting to encourage interaction between all of the students. Um, and this also, in, as part of Mesa's model, there's the ability to connect with a larger global network of farmers and um, and activists and educators and researchers that are involved in sustainable food systems work. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Anna to talk a little bit about the Spanish, the services for Spanish speakers. But if you have any questions about the internships, please reach out. Um, and our contact information is, at, is available at the end of the webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Leah. Buenos dias para todos y todas. Good morning, everybody. My name is Anna Galvis. 
and I work with MESA as an agroecology educator. I want to share with all of you that for OSA and MESA, to make this material available to wider audience, audiences is very, very important. This is why we are translating the webinars and some of the manuals and guides to Spanish. Please feel free to review it and share the material with your, within your network. Because as we know, seed production is crucial for food sovereignty. So this is why we are investing all this energy and effort in this. We highly encourage everybody, of course, including Spanish speakers, to apply to our seed internship program that Leah just described. Please, if you, uh, if you are a Spanish speaker and you want to have like a deeper information about it, please, please feel free to contact me at ana at mesaprogram.org. You can write your email in Spanish. I will respond it to you in Spanish too with more information. And as Leah said, the online platform is ready for you, for you to use. Please read it and enjoy it. Now I'm going to pass the word to Jared. All right, thank you so much, Leah and uh, Anna. My name is Jared Seistro. I'm the Research and Education Assistant Director for Organic Seed Alliance. Organic Seed Alliance is a nonprofit that works nationally, and we work on the effort to advance ethical seed solutions to meet needs in a changing world. So among the work that we do, one of the most crucial aspects is educating current and future seed growers to be able to supply the seed needs for sustainable agriculture. And this course is an important part of that. So today I'm going to be presenting primarily on the basics of how do you make a solid plan for deciding how you're going to produce seed crops for your farm and on your farm. I'm going to start this session by talking a little bit about biology around seed crop biology and really specifically as it relates to this planning process. Organic Seed Alliance has several manuals on crop specific biology and seed production and a basic seed saving guide that you can access for free from our website. At the end of this webinar, Michaela is going to walk through some of those resources, but I just mentioned that to say I'm not going to be spending a lot of time going into the details of the biology of seed crops in this webinar, but those resources are easily available to you through our website and in other locations. So when we're thinking about seed crop biology, some of the things that we want to think about in reference to crop production planning is thinking about it in terms of what seed crops can you handle? So thinking about things like isolation distance, um, thinking about things like how it integrates into your existing system, uh, how the demands exist for different crops at harvest time, and what sort of tools or equipment you might require. And this is going to depend on the biology, at least in part. So I'm going to walk through uh, some of the ways that we classify seed crops into um, in, there we go. Sorry, it took me a second to advance it. Hopefully I didn't just advance it a couple of times. We'll no, see. you're good. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Alice. Um, so there's a few different ways that we classify seed crops and it uh, helps us simplify how we think about them in our planning process. The first is based on their life cycle. So one way that we can look at seed crops is um, how quickly do they go through the process of growing from a seed uh, through the vegetative and reproductive cycles uh, on to producing seeds again. And one classification that we talk about are annual plants. These are plants that complete the reproductive cycle in one season. So they would be going muted all the way through to producing seed again in a single year or a single growing cycle. And though this is a broad classification, there are lots of nuances within this. So, for example, there can be widely 
a wide range in terms of when these crops might be flowering and when they might be ready to mature. So these crops may have their flowering and maturation and transition from vegetative to reproductive cycle triggered by things such as photo period, meaning how long the crops, uh, how much sunlight the crops are experiencing on a daily basis, how long the days are. Uh, it might be triggered based on the accumulated temperatures that they're receiving over the course of the year. So when you're planting your seed crops, understanding what are the needs for that seed crop to be able to properly mature seed in time in your season and planning uh, based on that to see first off if you can successfully produce that seed in your climate and secondly, when you would need to plan to plant it uh, in order to have it successfully mature are part of, those are both part of your planning process that are gonna be influenced by the biology of these annual crops. There are some crops that we talk about as uh, annuals that are technically perennial plants like tomatoes and peppers that in tropical areas are able to grow year after year and survive. But for most intents and purposes in temperate regions where we experience frost, we treat these plants as annuals. So one of the other broad classifications that we use to talk about seed crops are biennial plants. These are plants that complete their reproductive cycle in two seasons. So this means that in the first season, they would be growing vegetatively, typically growing some kind of fleshy storage organs like roots or leaves or stems that store energy, allow them to survive through the winter. And then the, in their second season of life, they transition from vegetative to reproductive growth where they will then uh, produce uh, flower stalks, flower, and set seed and mature that seed. So these crops, when we're thinking about the planning of them, um, some of the th considerations for planning are that they require a longer window of, of growth. So we're talking about two years instead of one year. Um, these also have have a, a different timing relative to annual crops in terms of when they're planted. These may be being planted in the summer rather than in the spring, and this will require thinking ahead when you're making your maps and your crop plans for the year to ensure that you have the space. Also, in a in a Mediterranean climate, such as on the in the West, where we don't have rain typically in the summer, these crops may require irrigation to germinate the seeds if they're planted in the summer. And so planning around the irrigation requirements to get these biennial crops started in the summer and thinking about that irrigation um, in terms of how it fits within the, um, the other crops that surround it and whether those crops can uh, be able to receive some accidental amount of uh, irrigation spray while you're watering your biennial crops to get them to um, germinate. Some of these are, are some of the challenges around planning, integrating biennials within your cropping system. In addition, biennials, once they are uh, in grown for the first season, you have to decide how are they going to survive the winter? Are they going to survive the winter in place in their original field? Are the roots or stems going to be lifted and moved and replanted in another field on your farm? Or are they going to be stored off of the field in some kind of um, root cellar or other storage uh, location, in which case you'll need to plan ahead for how you'll be storing them. So those are some of the planning considerations when you're talking about biennial plants. So. Another broad way that plants are classified when we're talking about seed crops and another consideration within planting is the pollination systems. So crops for seed production are broadly divided into self-pollinated crops and cross-pollinated crops or selfers and crossers or inbreeders and outcrossers. There are a few different 
um, naming schemes for the same uh, basic difference in reproductive system. Wh one of which that the, are this in terms of these selfers are crops that primarily reproduce via self-pollination. So meaning that the pollen that a given flower receives is primarily coming from itself. So <clears throat> in the case of Self-pollinating crops, they tend to have perfect flowers, meaning that they have both the male and female sexual organs all within each flower, um, and that those anthers and stigma are in close proximity to other within that flower, so that the pollen can easily move from anther to stigma. Often, the petals of these self-pollinated crops remain closed or in some way seal out pollen from outside sources so that thus ensuring that the pollen that is received by a given flower really is just coming from that flower so for example that would be what happens in many bean uh, species sometimes these petals will open after the pollination has already occurred so the other broad classification that we talk about are cross-pollinated crops or crossers or outcrossers and these, just like the self-pollinated crops, have systems in place to help ensure that they self-pollinate. Cross-pollinated crops have various methods to encourage cross-pollination. So some of these include the separation of male and female parts. So potentially having flowers that contain only male parts or female parts, or even plants that consist entirely of male flowers or entirely of female flowers. Um, they may have self-incompatibility mechanisms that are genetic mechanisms that inhibit the germination and growth of pollen within a, on, on the pistil of a plant, of a flower that is too closely related to the flower that the pollen came from. There may also be temporal separation of sexual parts, meaning that the, um, the pollen of a flower may have all be released before the stigma is receptive to pollen, so thus ensuring that the pollen is all been, has left the flower before any pollen can uh, be used to pollinate that flower. Cross pollinated crops often also have showy flowers, uh, nectar to encourage insects, bees, uh, and other insects to convey pollen from flower to flower, and they may produce uh, a lot more flower, or a lot more pollen relative to self-pollinated crops, thus ensuring that that abundance of pollen can be carried from one flower to another. It's important to note that although it simplifies our discussion to talk about self-pollinated crops and cross-pollinated crops, they in fact exist across a wide spectrum from some crop species and families being highly cross-pollinated, which with almost all of the plants arising from cross-pollination um, to plants that are entirely or close to entirely self-pollinated, but that there's a range in the middle that this um, spectrum influences two things that are relevant for crop planning. First is population size, which means the number of plants that you'll need to be producing seed from in order to ensure a healthy population. For most seed production purposes, if you're on a commercial scale producing seed, uh, you will not have as many concerns around meeting minimum population sizes. However, if you're on a garden scale or you are producing seed potentially of a rare variety where you're seed limited or you want to be producing uh, many, many uh, lots of the same species, for example, there may be reasons why the number of plants that you can grow of a given uh, variety are, are limited, in which case it's important for you to know what the minimum population size is. And this information is fairly readily available. OSA has a publication that Michaela is going to walk you through at the end of this webinar called our Seed Saving Guide that has a nice table 
It talks about what some of these minimum population sizes are, and there are a number of other resources. There's the seed garden that Michaela and I wrote that goes through uh, the population size requirements for uh, several, uh, I think over 70 different seed crops. So that's one place that you can go to reference uh, and understand what these minimum population sizes are to keep your variety intact. Um, the second very key and um, more frequently relevant piece of information that you need to know that's related to the self-pollination and cross-pollination of your species is isolation distance. So isolation distance is the minimum distance that two uh, species, uh, uh, two varieties of the same species need to be separated in order to prevent accidental cross-pollination between those varieties. And so knowing this distance is very important for seed production because the, the quality and varietal integrity of your seed crops is going to depend and you maintaining adequate isolation distance between those varieties if they're the same species. And isolation distance depends largely on what kind of mechanisms exist in these plants, whether they're cross-pollinated or self-pollinated, and if they're cross-pollinated, how they are cross-pollinated. Typically what we see is that highly self-pollinated crops require less isolation distance and as we move across the spectrum, cross-pollinated crops that are pollinated uh, require a medium amount of isolation distance, and then those that are wind-pollinated require the greatest amount of isolation distance. Just like population size, you can find specific numbers for these isolation distances in both OSA's seed guide and in the seed garden book, as well as in the, uh, there's uh, John Navazio's um, organic seed grower book that, that has these references. And if you're in a, a contracted relationship with a seed company, they'll typically provide you with some guidelines for what their minimum isolation requirements are for the seed crop that they're contracting you for. So now that we've covered some of the very basics of seed crop biology and how those how that biology affects your planning, I want to walk you through some of the step-by-steps -steps of how to plan your seed crops. And this is really important because good planning is, is going to be one of the keys in helping you be successful as a seed grower. I broke it down into a few questions that you should ask yourself as you're making your plan for production for the year. First is, uh, what can you grow? Second is, how much should you grow? Third is, where can you grow it? And finally, when should you plant it? And that's what I'm gonna spend the next um, 15 minutes or so covering here. So first off, let's talk about what can you grow? Of course, the environment that your farm is situated in is a key factor in what you can grow. For example, there could be some crops that you might be able to grow in your climate, but they might be marginally productive. Um, in this case, yields could be lower and the risk of crop failure could be higher. If the crop is important enough to you or the value of the seed is high enough, it still might be worth it. However, you need to be leery of producing large quantities or attempting to produce large quantities of seed of crops that are marginal in your environment, especially if you don't have much experience in that. So how do you know if a seed crop is something that you can produce in your environment. This is something that you're going to be learning from experience. You're going to be learning from other seed growers in your area. One resource, at least for the Western states that's available to you is OSA's Climatic Considerations Guide that Michaela is going to be talking about at the end of the webinar that has some information classifying seed crops based on their climatic requirements and that can help you in this planning process. The second factor in thinking about what can you grow is isolation. So as I talk, uh, when you're looking at seed crops, some of them have different requirements for the minimum isolation distance that they need to be separated from other varieties of that same species. So 
when you're considering what crops to grow, you need to ask yourself, first, do I have sufficient isolation from flowering crops of the same species that might be growing on my neighbor's farm or garden? Do I have adequate isolation from seed or non-seed crops of that same species on my own farm? For example, if you're trying to produce a spinach seed crop and you also have some uh, spinach that you're producing for uh, leaf spinach, uh, will you be able to ensure that that uh, leaf spinach is not going to be accidentally going to flower in the middle of the season and contaminating your seed crop? Our third is, are there any weeds in your area that might be the same species and could accidentally cross with your seed crop? For example, uh, Queen Anne's lace is the same species as carrots and will readily cross if it's flowering within the isolation distance of carrots. So in general, these isolate, if you're growing something that has a isolation distance requirement that prevents, that only allows you to put uh, one variety of that species on your farm, that's going to, to limit the number that you can produce on your farm. However, if the crop is really an important crop for you, um, either because it's high value or it has some added value for your farm, you may be able to isolate with cages. And this is something that um, OSA has some, some references for in our, um, in our publications. So third factor in thinking about what you can grow is whether you have the skill set to successfully grow that crop. So each crop might require slightly different skills to produce, to harvest, and to clean. So have you grown this crop before? At what scale have you grown it? And I would recommend if you're new to a crop, um, especially if it's something that maybe is has different requirements in terms of production techniques or equipment, start small and learn from your experience before you uh, go larger. So finally, do you have the specialized tools that allow you to easily produce harvest and clean the seed of those crops. So this picture here, for example, this is a vine thresher, uh, which is a tool that is extremely useful if you're intending to produce large quantities of certain wet seeded crops like summer squash or cucumbers. And um, so thinking about do you have do you have the tools? Many seed crops uh, are there is a limitation that is based on whether or not you have the equipment and know how to successfully harvest it and clean it. And you won't um, want to be stuck at the end of the season with acres of a seed crop that you don't have the, the equipment and know how to get it out of the field and get it to shippable, um, clean quality. So, Second question um, here in, in the, the larger scheme of things is how much should you grow? So you want to understand uh, first and foremost, what exactly is the, the market for your seed? So one of, the, one of the quotes that I heard a long time ago as I was starting on this road of, of seed production was from an experienced seed grower who said it's really very easy to grow way more seed of a given variety than there is demand for. One of the amazing things about seed is how big of an impact it could have. You might be able to produce all of the seed that exists, uh, that, that there's demand for in the entire world for you know a given variety. You might be able to produce that on an acre or two. So um, you want to understand, you know, where is there a market and how much demand is there for a given crop? One of the challenges is to be able to fill up your farm with enough different varieties that allow you to have a market that will absorb the quantity of seed that you produced of each of those varieties. So where will that seed be going? Will you be selling it via seed packs and seed racks, you know, via direct retail sale? Uh, that you'll be marketing yourself? Um, if so, can you estimate how much you'll need 
keeping in mind how many years you think that seed would be good before you need to grow it out again? Or will you be selling it on contract? If so, is there a clause for overage in that contract? In other words, if you produce too much seed for the seed company that's contracting you, can you still sell that extra seed to the company? Because although meeting your contract and producing enough seed to fulfill your contract for a seed company is really important for building your long-term reputation, you will be hurting your bottom line if you consistently produce way too much seed uh, that goes to waste just to ensure that you have enough. So once you have much seeds you might want, it's time to work backwards to think about how much area you would need to devote to each variety that you'll be producing. And one of the keys to this is having an estimate of the yield of that variety in a given area. And this, unfortunately, can be extremely challenging as seed yields can vary tremendously, not just between species, but between varieties within a species and even between locations. So how do you get some good yield info that allows you to make good plans? So probably the best place is through your own research because it is often so location specific, which I would, this leads in turn to an important point that investing in some research and development will help you succeed. And what I mean by this is in addition to your larger bread and butter seed production that you plan on playing, paying your bills with, um, also look for small contracts or conduct small um, speculative trials of crops that you may not have much experience with but are considering for the future. And these small trials and small productions will yield information um, not just on, you know, on yield, but will also be providing you information with where are the bottlenecks, where are the challenges in producing this crop, how do you harvest it, how do you clean it, um, are there diseases that you need to be aware of. So. This is something that good seed growers are always doing to expand their horizons. So, um, the the second place to second best place to to figure out yield information besides your own experience is from other growers. So, ideally, these would be growers in your own region, so that way they'll have some experience with how those varieties produce in your particular climate. Um, and so if you can find them, ask them what kind of yields they've gotten on the variety you're planning on producing, or at very least, ask them sort of the yields they've gotten on that species. How variable are those yields from year to year? Some seed crops are relatively consistent in their production each year, whereas others, with onions being kind of the classic example, can range massively from year to year in terms of yields, which makes them a riskier crop and more challenging to plan around. Um, one of the other places that you can look for resources, ask the seed company. If you're contracting with the seed company, ask them to put you in touch with other growers who produced that variety for them in the past and contact them to see both what sort of yields they've received from that and also any production challenges around it. Final places that many seed growers turn to uh, for some rough estimates of yields is the Knott's Handbook, which is a classic book. And in it, there's a table that has some pretty rough and generally considered to be optimistic yields uh, estimates for a variety of crops. These yield estimates, is, this is something that OSA has seen an ongoing need for uh, better information on and something that we've been putting in proposals to produce some a, a database, a yield database that would be beneficial to growers to, to help reduce some of this uncertainty around. So once you have an idea of the amount of seed that you need to fulfill your contract or your, your needs for retail sale, and you have an idea of what some of the estimated yields might be for a given area, then you can use this to plan the total area you'll need and to place that within your farm. So above is an example spreadsheet that was provided to us by a 
experienced seed grower. And Michaela is going to be walking through kind of how you would design a spreadsheet like this yourself at the end of this webinar. But this kind of gives you a sense of working backwards from the um, amount of seed ordered by a seed company to the estimated yield. And in this case, the grower is working on a, on a per bed estimate. And then that in turn gives them a sense of how many beds they would need. Um, in the case of kind of fractional beds, they, they round up for, to simplify their planning. And then, um, and then this also gives them a, a sense of sort of what the estimated per bed revenue is to, to make sure that they're balancing some of their lower revenue producers with higher revenue producers. So now that you have a sense of what crops to grow and how much space you need for each of those crops, it's time to make plans for where to grow them on your farm. So as I talked about before, isolation requirements are a big part of that. So there will be some crops where you can grow multiple lots of the same species, multiple varieties of the same species within your farm, as long as you set up your fields in a way that adequately separates them within your farm. You know, this is especially the case uh, in the case of self-pollinated crops where the isolation requirements are a lot lower. The second thing when we think about where to grow it on your farm, uh, you should be making, just, just following good standard farming practices, you should make a plan to rotate where each of the crop families are planted in your farm so that you can avoid replanting crops from the same family in the same spot year after year. And so again, that will allow you to reduce the risk of both uh, diseases and uh, pests and will uh, be balancing some of the sort of fertility requirements for those crops. Finally, you should think about the varying irrigation requirements of your crops as you make your plan. And what I mean by this is that for many dry seeded crops, in other words, seeds, uh, crops where you're harvesting the seed as a dry seed from dry plants when it's mature, um, they shouldn't be watered uh, with overhead water once uh, stalk elongation and flowering begins. So if you've got uh, crops that will require overhead watering later in the season, either because they're vegetable crops uh, for uh, your other operation, or as I mentioned before, if you're needing to water your biennial crops in the summer to get the seeds to germinate when they're summer planted, um, then you'll want to make sure and plan that ahead so that way there those irrigation requirements for things that require overhead water later in the season are not um, negatively impacting your maturing dry seeded crops that do not want to be receiving overhead water later in the summer. So once you have a sense of these varying requirements of isolation distance, of crop rotation, of irrigation, you can make a map of your farm and can either do this on paper or on the computer and try and synthesize your plans for how much space you needed for each of those crops and, and where they're going to go. And these maps, as most farmers knows, know, um, become very, very valuable as time goes on because you'll be able to refer back to them in the following years to continue your crop rotations and allow you to have um, adequately long um, rotations between your families, which will um, is, is one of the keys in terms of successfully managing pests and diseases on your farm. Um, one of the things that you'll want to... Um, when you're making your rotation plans and you're making your cropping plans, try and think hard about how to make your um, plans both as simple and as flexible as possible. Because one of the challenges I've heard from seed growers is that they may not have final contracts in place until fairly late in the season, um, potentially in a late winter, or even sometimes into early spring, in which point you'll benefit from having as many options in terms of places you can place things in the field. So finally, the last step of the planning process I'm going to be talking about today is when plant. So again, first uh, work backwards from 
some of the critical times in the seed production process for each of your crops. For example, when do you want your crop to be flowering? You typically want your crop to be flowering during a dry period, and you also would like the temperatures during flowering to be ideal for flowering in that crop. Different crops have um, uh, different flowering requirements that uh, are often, crops are often most sensitive to both high and low temperatures during flowering. So you want to pick a time that they would be flowering um, that is as ideal as possible. Um, and this webinar, we don't have time to go through that on a crop by crop basis, but again, um, at Organic Seed Alliance's website, we have more specifics in terms of some of the crop by crop requirements. Second, think about the timing of harvest. So ideally, you'd want to be harvesting your seed crops during a dry window uh, because especially for dry seeded crops, they are extremely sensitive to receiving rain or precipitation during that final maturation and harvest phase. Um, and you'd also like to be harvesting them before uh, extremely damaging freezes happen. So these are some of the kind of the, the bottlenecks at the end of the season that in turn are going to be influencing when you want to be planting at the beginning of the season. So with those limitations in mind, working backwards, if you do have some flexibility in your planting date at the beginning of the season, I would recommend aiming for some of the, the best times to plant based on having good soil temperature, being able to adequately work your soil and, um, and uh, weed your field, do uh, you know, adequate tillage and um, final field preparation and finishing before planting. One of the things that I think is important to think about as you transition away from um, some other uh, growing uh, systems like uh, CSA farming and, and move into seed crops is that unlike uh, a CSA, you're not necessarily planting multiple successions of a given seed crop. So you're not really benefiting from pushing a super early planting if you don't need it. Instead, wait for, you know, if you do have flexibility, having worked backwards from when you need uh, your crop to be flowering, when you need it to be maturing. If you do have flexibility in that planting date, rather than aiming for the earliest possible planting date, you know, and pushing it into, you know, a wet, weedy field, wait for the, um, if you can, wait for the field conditions to be optimal. So with that, um, I'd like to turn this over to Michaela Colley, who's going to talk about some additional resources that exist for you to be able to capability for doing good crop planning. Okay, so, all right, well, yeah. I'm going to move forward then and okay. uh, navigate you to some resources. Okay, great, um, thank you, Jared. Uh, as Alice said in the beginning of this presentation, this is the second year of our developing a series of webinars to walk um, growers and uh, new muted present through the season of seed production and we delivered a series last year in 2016 and all of those webinars are archived on eOrganic and if you do a search for organic seed webinars eOrganic you'll see links to all of the prior webinars and I'm uh, pointing that out now because uh, at the end of the season, you know everything that you needed to know to start the season. And so as the second round of participants, you have the opportunity to go back and look at some of those webinars from the previous year. And a number of the planning resources that are uh, presented throughout the season are really relevant from the beginning. Um, and I just wanna walk you through a few of those resources and give you a little orientation to what's available online. Uh, when you go to the eOrganic site and follow Alice, Alice's links to resources connected to this webinar, those links will take you to the Organic Seed Alliance homepage, which is where, or where the publications themselves are archived, where they live. And when you land on this page, go ahead and click Publications. This is our new website. And it, has, it brings you to this publication page that has searchability. 
And through this page, you can narrow down your search to webinars, which will take you to all of the webinars that are archived on, um, linked from our website. And these are hosted on eOrganic, but here's where they're all presented in order and it's easy to access them. And here is the series from last year, the six webinars. And I just want to point out from the beginning of the year, those that I would recommend you look at now would include the introduction, which has a lot of duplications of information from this year. But again, we'll walk you into a little bit more detail of the climatic considerations of picking your seed crop and uh, some of the field planning tools. Um, the second one I would recommend that you watch in advance of the season is trials and selection. We will be covering that in this year's series, but uh, when you start out the season planning your field, it's good to think about how many crops you might want to put in variety trials of to learn a little bit more about the crop and integrate that into the beginning of the season production planning rather than um, you know coming back in another couple of months and doing a post haste. Uh, the last one I would recommend that you watch in advance is all the, way, all the way to the end of last year's season, seed contracting and economics. And um, that webinar presented several planning tools for assessing whether or not your crop is economically viable, including some of the resources that are linked to this webinar. But watching that webinar, you can hear directly from uh, seed producers and seed contractors, how they approach uh, tracking information to figure out whether or not a crop has been economically viable or not. You can start at the beginning of the season and say, well, I have contracts in place for these, these crops at these prices in this much space. But at the end of the season, how do you look back and assess what all of the production inputs and expenses that went into that crop uh, were in order to assess whether or not it was actually um, what was the net versus gross revenue from the season. And uh, so that's the orientation to the webinars. You can also, um, on this same page, access some of our publications, the how-to guides, and here's where you will find the seed saving guide for gardeners and farmers that Jared was mentioning. This is the guide that includes um, a page uh, that will more crop specific information regarding pollination systems, population sizes that are recommended and isolation distances. And this is what you will need to refer to in order to make sure that your field map, your field planning of your planting scheme is ensuring that you have adequate isolation and population sizes to uh, prevent cross-contamination or uh, impacts of narrowing genetic diversity within a crop. The other publication that's on this page is the Climatic Considerations for Seed Crops. And as Jared mentioned, this guide was written specifically focused on the Pacific Northwest and Intermountain Western region. However, if you go to the guide, there's quite a bit of information about specific maximum minimum temperatures during different times of year that impact the, the um, feasibility of producing a high quality seed crop within that region. And there are a lot of crops that you can get away with producing a seed crop in your climate, a great diversity of crops that will actually mature viable seed. But what this this guide is focused on is which crops are best suited for your climate because those are the crops that you're going to be able to be the highest quality seed grower and likely have the greatest success in seed production and greatest yields compared to growers in less optimum climates. So it's a good uh, guide to consider both for thinking about what you can produce. There's also some information in it about how you can modify your climatic environment to better suit the crop if it's not optimum for your region, but also to steer you toward contracting with those crops for commercial seed production that are going to bring the greatest success. Again, this site also uh, has uh, the worksheets and some of the planning resources that are available from Organic Seed Alliance online, including a few planning sheets that are related to planning your variety trials 
and a seed crop record. And I think that's perhaps one, Alice, that we haven't added to the list of resources for this specific webinar, but we could put it up unmuted through the webinar. Sure. And the seed crop, the seed crop record is just a printout sheet um, that you could keep in a three ring binder if that's your preferred method of archiving information. And it's just a good worksheet for making sure that you're considering all of the aspects that Jared went over in planning out your field and, and your crop space, um, including uh, you know the crop life cycle, uh, recording any information about planted, what kind of population size you had. And again, this worksheet could be uh, very valuable in the future when you wanna look back upon a crop at the end of the season and say, was it a successful crop or not? If I ran out of season for maturing the crop in the fall because I uh, it was still setting seed when the frost and the rain came, you can use this record to go back and, and remind yourself, when did I plant? What was my plan in the beginning of the season? So just another resource. And the resources that we present here are really a gleaning of tools that we've collected from farmers who are seed producers who we feel are uh, have developed some useful tools for themselves and have had some success in seed production and, and are willing to share those resources with others and some resources that we've developed or we've utilized in our own seasonal planning. But ultimately, every grower is going to need to figure out what method of information management works for your system. Um, here at Organic Seed Alliance, we have a number of field locations and a number of crops going on every year. And so what we do is uh, um, maintain a Google spreadsheet so that anybody out in the field, whether it's one of your field interns or part of your management crew, can go in on a daily basis and enter information. So it gets archived all in one location and not on a number of clipboards or worksheets or uh, field planning notebooks that are in somebody's pocket out in the field. And this is a very, very simple template uh, that's also available in one of the links, just a plain Excel spreadsheet that includes information about what crop you were producing. Um, uh, wait, sorry, this is the original uh, field season planning page that uh, allows you to record in one location what are all the crops and projects that you have going on that season, looking at all of those crops uh, in, in the timeline of anticipation of when they would be planted, when they would be transplanted, when you would be wanting to uh, harvest seed and how much space is required. And then we utilize that information to create a field planting map that literally has indicators of individual rows and feet within each row. So just one way to really visualize how um, on a meter by meter basis that field space is going to be uh, utilized to maintain rotations to ensure that uh, there's enough adequate row footage space for the production contracts that you have planned. And then we use this spreadsheet to record the weekly activities by month. And in many ways, this becomes just a really long laundry list of activities. We seeded peppers on this date, and most farms probably do some sort of log keeping of annual activities in this way. But we find that uh, while it's tedious, this is the best resource for going back at the end of the season and saying, when did I plant that? How much space did I plant? Uh, were there any issues going on? Did the plants look healthy going into the field? Uh, what sort of fertility applications did I utilize? This can also be a spreadsheet where you track some information about your time in the field related to each activity because it's logged on a day-by-day -day basis. So you could utilize a spreadsheet like this to also start tracking what kind of labor resources were required to pull off of a seed crop and then uh, come back to this resource at the end of the season when you do your uh, post season economic analysis. Um, other resources that we have links to include this 
spreadsheet, which is called the example crop plan. This is the spreadsheet that Jared showed a couple of slides of. It was created by Sebastian Aguilar, uh, Chickadee Farm, who's a seed producer in the Applegate Valley. And uh, his farm is 90% seed production is his income source. And he shared this uh, spreadsheet of, of how he approaches his field planning from the beginning of the season. And uh, this is available online for all of you to utilize. Uh, he starts with a page that looks at how, what are the production contracts that he has that year. And uh, this is, allows an economic forecasting tool that is also a tool for assessing how much field space is needed to pull off that number of contracts. It's easy enough to say, sure, I'll do this and this and this and this, but how is that going to plan out? How's that going to impact your field space and your rotation needs uh, for your field planting that year? So the spreadsheet includes each crop, the number of pounds that are ordered by the seed company, cost per or price per pound that's offered by the seed company, so a projection of what your total income could be if all goes quite well. Um, uh, but then also uh, then breaking down each of those crops, as Jared was touching upon, into what kind of field space is required to achieve the yield of the number of pounds that were ordered, and then breaking down that estimated yield to the kind of bed space, the amount of the bed space that will be needed to pull off of that crop. And from, um, he also creates this planting calendar, and the planting calendar would then include each of the crops that he's producing that year, the number of beds that he would be planting, um, the, the, and then working back in the season, all of these projected dates so you can start to see when your field activities have to happen by in order to have mature uh, um, seed crop at the end of the season and uh, working back from there and when you think you would be out of the field and what sort of dates prior to even seeding and planting that crop, you would need to be working up the field and starting your transplants in the greenhouse. So this becomes a very detailed uh, week by week planning tool to ensure that your seed production is on schedule and on target for successful harvest in the fall, and also highlighting when some of those major labor uh, peaks and valleys might happen throughout the planting season. And then from that spreadsheet, he uh, just uh, very similar to OSA's um, uh, Excel spreadsheet of our field map, he then turns that into uh, a field map of which rows and how much space, which beds are going to contain which crops for the season. And this is, uh, again, as Jared said, will then become an investment valuable resource for ensuring that you have enough space and figuring out if you need to accommodate more crops at any point or you want to put some trials in, you can see where you might have a, a field available or a field that you may be planting later in the season for an overwintering crop going in after the seed crops are completed. So again, one more planning tool that um, can be a resource. Uh, as I mentioned, I encourage you all to also watch the economics webinar the last webinar series of the 2016 webinars. And this webinar included a very detailed enterprise budget created by um, uh, uh, Daniel Brisbois from Tournay Sol in Canada. He's a grower in Eastern Canada, a seed producer who has done quite a bit of work in analyzing the economics of seed production and developing uh, enterprise budgeting tools specific to seed production. There are a lot of enterprise budget templates available online, but very few of them are really uh, focused on seed production and the kind of inputs then and resources and uh, income expense comparisons that go into analyzing a seed crop as opposed to a vegetable row crop. Um, and if you watch the webinar, he does a fabulous job of showing how he utilizes this spreadsheet in tracking his inputs throughout the year, including 
the task that is accomplished on a on a in this could uh, overlap with your field planning activities spreadsheet but the tasks that go into producing a seed crop the cost of labor the labor hours needed whether it was for planting or weeding or harvesting and then machinery costs and machinery cost is is i believe he translates into both um, you know just the hour impact on the equipment which needs to be taken into consideration because equipment does cost money and has to pay its own way in the long run but also the amount of time that was utilized in in utilizing the equipment for the seed production uh, crop i would also mention that many growers that i see begin to dial in on their product their economics translate these costs into a per bed rate and um, that was both Sebastian and Daniel's perspective in how they analyze uh, the cost and the income of each seed crop and compare uh, the economics of output. So this third tab, and, and again, Daniel in the webinar does a much better job of walking you through the details of it, breaks down on a bed by bed basis uh, your profitability is ultimately going to depend on the uh, amount that you produced, the total input costs of, um, of the labor and resources that went into producing the crop, and the kind of yield that you attain. And so uh, it's an important, this is all about one crop. This is a Daniel spreadsheet just looking at a brassica rapa crop, but comparing if his yields were at a certain level for um, by row, uh, if you have a low yield versus a moderate or high yield, uh, what would your income, your net income look like? And if you adjust your contract price so that we can start looking at what price is necessary in order to achieve an, uh, an economically viable crop. And then he compares also some various management techniques, uh, comparing over three different seasons, whether you decided to manage your weeds with hand hoeing or with some landscape fabric or with machinery cultivation are all going to obviously be variables within the economics of your seed crop in terms of the production input. Um, so again, I encourage you to look at uh, at that webinar in advance of this season because it's going to help you think through what sort of record keeping do I need to do throughout the season so that at the end of the season I'm able to recreate an assessment of the economics of the crop uh, from uh, a crop by crop enterprise budgeting perspective. Um, and I think that is unmuted tools that we had presented. Uh, Jared, is there anything you would add to some of the tools and resources perspective? Uh, no, I think you did a great job covering it, Michaela. Okay. Well, with that, I'll go ahead and hand the screen back to Alice and we can take some questions. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that. So we're going to have some question time now. So um, I know we had a couple of questions already in the queue, but um, not too many. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, you can feel free to type one in and chances are you will get an answer. So um, here's someone who wants to know what beginner seed crop she might try this year. Um, they, the person lives in um, the front range of Colorado, but um, can you suggest some beginner seed crops that it might not be too late to try this year? Um, well, in Colorado, off the top of my head, I would say in guiding beginners towards seed crops, uh, certainly starting with some annual crops so that you only have one season of managing the crop and the timing of planting is a little easier to capture than with a biennial where the crop is planted one year and overwinters and then is harvested the following year. And uh, for beginners, it depends on your your location, but if isolation distance is an issue, then I would steer folks toward the, the more self-pollinating. Um, and a couple of those that I think are well suited to the climate in Colorado and are fairly easy to harvest and process 
would include dry beans and tomatoes off the top of my head. Both um, are fairly straightforward in terms of the production and there are several uh, resources available for how you harvest those crops. It would also give you experience trying a dry seeded crop versus a wet seeded crop. The tomatoes, the whole fruit is harvested and processed, processed, but that's not a particularly difficult thing to do if you have information on how to do it. And uh, you don't have to maintain particularly large population sizes for either of those crops either. And uh, again, beans are fairly easy to know when to harvest and uh, can be hand harvested or mechanically harvested. Um, Jared, do you want to chime in on that at all? The, those were actually the same crops I was thinking of as well. Um, I think those are those are good fits for that climate and yeah, for 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 good places to start. Um, could try, you know, again depending on your isolation distance, you could try um, uh, some of the cucurbits. Um, those could do well in that region um let's see at this time of year i mean one of the challenges if you're if you're just starting now i guess is sort of the length of the season if you've got things like tomatoes and cucurbits um you, know, you may have wanted to be looking at you know here here you're certainly starting to push up against the edges of that window um whereas dry beans yeah maybe a, a better fit um Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll think about um, some other crops and if they come to mind, I'll, I'll mention them. Sounds good. Okay. So um, in a less perfect climate, um, will a, a seed that's, be grown, that's grown in that climate be um, better adapted to your locality, so better than a seed produced from far away? So the one of the things that I, I usually mention when I talk about um, and the, the basics of, 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 of seed saving and all the pieces of it is that as a seed producer or a seed saver, you are, whether, whether kind of whether you like it or not, you are a plant breeder, meaning that you, the, the seeds that you save from the plants that you save seeds from, um, there may be some degree of variability in terms of the genetics of the plants that you save seeds from and you can do one of two things if you if, if you do job of seed production and saving seeds from the best plants the ones that are most uh, doing the best in your location and you do a good job of managing population size and isolation distance over the course of generations you could improve that variety in terms of its adaptedness to your location. So yes, over time, there's the potential that uh, if you do a good job uh, and there's adequate variability within the genetics of the seed crop that you're growing, that it can improve for your location. Um, there has have been some evidence uh, kind of more recently that sometimes that adaptation can even um, occur fairly rapidly, even within a, a single generation. Um, but again, it, it's going to depend a lot on, on both on, on which crops you're dealing with. Some crops, for example, when we're talking about things like, um, you know, dry beans or lettuce or tomatoes, um, if you're working with a commercial variety uh, that may have been bred to have very little genetic variability in it to begin with, um, when you're receiving that seed, there, there, there may not be a lot of uh, kind of genetic wiggle room there to be able to improve it for your environment. Um, and likewise, if, if you don't do a good job, of, if, if you end up uh, through um, various reasons not maintaining enough isolation distance or a large enough population size or end up selecting plants that are actually um, worse in your location, um, the, the quality can actually degrade. So I would say Short answer, yes, you, it, you can improve it for your location with all those above caveats. Okay, um, let's see. Um, how do you deal with longer isolation distances since farms are not huge and you can't control what other farms or even homeowners in a one mile radius or more are growing? 
um, I'll, 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 I'll take it for right now. And Michaela, if you want to chime in, feel free. But I would say there's a couple of things there. You're right. That is a challenge. Um, the isolation distance does, uh, there are variables that can affect what actual isolation distance you need. So those variables include whether there are some sort of uh, wind breaks or um, uh, pollen breaks uh, that, you know, stop the pollinators from, or the wind from moving pollen as far, and that can allow you to reduce your isolation distance. Um, likewise, if you're talking about uh, small patches of different varieties versus really large fields of different varieties, the, the smaller the, the uh, area of the variety, you know, the, the less isolation distance is required just because of it's a numbers game. If there's less pollen um, up in the air or on uh, insects, then there's less risk that that pollen is going to be moved from one uh, location to another. Um, and then uh, also another factor is just sort of the your your willingness to accept risks. Um, if it's something that's, uh, for example, if you're growing something like cilantro and your neighbor's also growing cilantro, and they're more or less the same cilantro. If you know if, if you end up getting an you know outcrossing of you know one in a thousand seeds. Um, you know, are the result of outcrossing between your your cilantro and your neighbor's cilantro. It may not um, be as important as with um, you know some things where that that the outcrossing um, the contamination from a, uh, a neighbor's field is is much more obvious or much more important. Whether we're talking about con, you know crossing with something that's you know genetically engineered that you know in the case of organic that puts your sort of you know that 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 you know, risks the, the quality of your seed, or it's, you know, a beet that's being crossed with a Swiss chard, in which case it's going to be very obvious and problematic. Um, I would say that, you know, seed growers struggle with this. You know, some of the things that they, that you often hear is uh, kind of cooperation. So, for example, you know, a grower in uh, my neck of the woods in Northern California uh, will provide free seeds to his neighboring farms to and neighboring, you know, gardeners around him, to, you know, to ensure that they basically grow the same uh, variety that he's growing. Uh, so that's kind of a, a way that you can, um, you know, you, you kind of get to know your community, who's growing what, and uh, ultimately, it, it, you know, you end up having some degree of negotiation and working with them. Uh, Michaela, I don't know if you've got any other tips for that. I would just mention if you are in a county that has a significant amount of seed production, there is uh, in many counties coordinated planning around isolation management for seed producers. And it's usually managed through the extension service or at least um, facilitated through an extension service. So if you don't know if there is a production planning, it's called formally called a pinning system. Uh, essentially the growers get together with a large map of the county at the beginning of the season and literally have a sort of um, hierarchical or lottery type system of placing pins on the map where their seed crop is going to be managed and then establishing standards for how closely somebody else could pin a crop near their crop based on the amount of isolation distance and is the isolation distance necessary to avoid cross-contamination and it's most relevant for the extremely outcrossing wind pollinated crops like corn and beets and spinach. Um, other than that, get to know your neighbors is the is the short answer. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, do you, do, does, are any re certificates or required for selling your own seeds? Uh, you want that one, Jared? Um, I, I can say that it depends, um, each, so, so, so what you're usually looking at is it's, um, requirements for selling seeds vary, uh, state by state. And often, um, there can even be, uh, differences on, at a, at a county level. Um, so, so talking to your county, um, agricultural office is a good place to go to see what the requirements are for being able to sell seed there are usually some requirements you know both to operate a business and to operate um, to be able to sell seeds and 
you know, beyond that, it, 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 it does become so specific to your locality that, that the best resource is often going to be um, your county ag office. Okay. Um, do you grow crops differently for seed production than for fruit production, or is it still about maximizing yield so that you maximize the amount of seed produced? Uh, I would say, and this goes back to the earlier question about uh, adaptation of local seed crops, the quality of a seed is going to be a combination of the genetics that um, are within the seed, which is going to be impacted by the kind of selection activities that Jared was describing. And then the quality of the seed is also due to the environment that it was produced in. So that's a combination of whether or not the local climate was conducive enough to optimum timing of seed set and uh, length of season and temperatures through um, uh, pollination and maturation of the seed. And it also depends on the, the uh, quality of, of the field management. And so it is true that uh, a, a seed crop should be managed with adequate fertility, adequate water, adequate weeding, just as you would a vegetable or a fruit crop in order to have the highest quality seed. Uh, having said that, in the leafy crops, it is also possible, and I think this is probably a bit more of a problematic um, potential in conventional seed production than in organic seed production, it is possible to over fertilize with nitrogen plant um, grow so vegetatively that it doesn't shift into putting as much energy into the seed production aspect. But I think the potentiality is to under fertilize rather than to over fertilize when it comes to seed production because it's a long season crop in the field uh, and and the essentially the energy, the growth, the nutrition metabolites that are in the vegetable crop are what the plant draws from to feed the seed that's maturing on the plant. And so you, you don't really want to ever cut the water prematurely unless that crop is really going into the final drying and seed set phase, but you want to let the crop go through as healthy and long of a season as it needs to produce a um, uh, a high yielding, high quality seed. Um, can you recommend a resource that will identify what plant seeds require stratification? Um, can you recommend a good germination chart like that? Mm. Optima mm. Optimal temperatures? Mm. Um, well, mostly, you know, mostly seed catalogs are where I go to for, for information about that sort of thing. Jared, do you know, it does not have any more specific information about so, I mean, temperatures and stratification, things like a that. A lot of seed companies um, will post the charts online, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I know yeah. Fitco has one for flowers. I'm not sure. Um, but I know Johnny yeah. um, does a lot mm -hmm. of, um, has a lot of resources like that. So guide. Might be a good place mm -hmm. to yeah, start. That, that, yeah, that, that, that's a good resource. Um, there is the, so depending on kind of what, what you're talking about, I mean, for, yeah, for, for kind of, Straightforward uh, germination guides. I think that the seed company and the seed catalogs is a great place to look for maybe more uh, exacting uh, germination strategies for you know for uh, seed crops. You can look to some of the um, the uh, the seed certifying agencies and the and the um, I think actually the Federal Seed Act has their publication online that will sort of tell you what the the germination times and temps are that they recommend. Um, there used to be, um, when you're talking about uh, kind of harder to germinate crops, whether these are native plants, um, uh, flowers, etc. there used to be a great guide online that walked through all of those. Unfortunately, that link recently died, and I haven't found the, the updated version of it. I think it was um, published out of, well, I want to say it was published out of Universe is published out of Arizona, but I haven't found the. I haven't. I should contact the the original authors. Uh, I haven't found an updated version of it, and it was it was a great guide that that had for more kind of odd 
um, native plants that you know required you know maybe stratification or scarification and things like that. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, let's see, what where does one start with acquiring contracts? Are there um, standard <laughs> letters or templates out there that you could use as a guide, or um, do you most often just call them on the phone? Or how do you usually go about the contacting them? You want to take that, Jared? You want me to? You want to do it, Mikhail? Sure. Um, it's really about relationship building. Is the short answer is uh, finding opportunities to meet uh, seed company representatives and reach out to them for contracts. And some of those connections can be made online. Just um, looking at seed companies that have the uh, scale and crops that you might be interested in. It's, it's certainly worth a cold call. Um, I would also say one, just a, a plug for OSA and eOrganic, one of the best places to meet seed, uh, organic seed companies that are directly contracting with a variety of scale of growers is the Organic Seed Growers Conference. And we host it in Corvallis, Oregon every other year. The next one will be in February 2018. So it's a great opportunity to go and meet people face to face, both other seed producers to learn more about their experience contracting with companies, but also to shake hands with seed companies directly and let them know that you're interested in contracting. Um, in the past, Organic Seed Alliance had an online networking database that we called the Seed Producers Database, which was essentially a contact relation management tool for seed growers and seed buyers to, to meet each other online. And we are in the process of um, retooling and relaunching um, some sort of networking tool of that sort, but I don't have a firm date of when that'll be available online. Um, and what else, Jared? What else am I forgetting? Uh, we, there was also, let me just mention this again, last year's webinar series, November 15th, the, the last series uh, webinar number six, which was also the one that covered seed economics, covered the, con the topic of contracting. And we had a couple of seed company representatives on the webinar uh, sharing their advice and information to seed producers about how to work with seed companies when to approach them, how to approach them, what the expectations are, what a contract looks like, how to negotiate, that sort of thing. Uh, and it was a couple of different scales of seed companies that were uh, participating in that webinar. So I recommend watching it for a little more personal guidance. Yeah. Um, Alice, we, yes. Alice, yes. this is Leah. This, sure. I just wanted to add uh, to what Michaela was saying, a quick plug for the internship and the online Organic Seed Alliance course. If there are participants that are in either, the, either of those programs, there is some built-in support um, for contacting and, uh, and connecting um, with seed companies and, and contracting. So I just wanted to add that. Okay, yeah, so I would recommend if you want to find out um, about these events, you can um, subscribe to the eOrganic mailing list and also to the Organic Seed Alliance mailing list, um, and then you will receive announcements about these upcoming events. So, um, yeah, I guess we have time for maybe one more question here. So let me find someone who hasn't asked a question before here. So do you have any recommendations regarding fungal diseases? I know we're going to have a webinar in a couple of months, um, one of which does um, address pests and diseases. So I definitely recommend attending that or watching the recording of last year's. But um, Jared, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Last couple of minutes? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that is a good resource. Uh, we have on the on eOrganic. There's also some um, in the the seed resource guide uh, is is another resource that um, within that there's some information on managing um, pests and diseases. Some real general um, across the board strategies for managing fungal diseases in seed crops uh, really come around just good management practices for seed in general. So kind of some of the things Michaela uh, talked about for uh, managing seed crops in terms of giving them adequate fertility and water, um, 
and um, but not necessarily um, over fertilizing to the point where they become you know when you're talking about leafy crops they become super lush in growth um, instead you know what it, it, you know again though it's a lower risk for organics um, you know excess nitrogen can produce kind of softer tissues that are more susceptible to fungal diseases. You also want to be thinking, again, as you transition from thinking about uh, maybe, you know, vegetable crop production to seed crop production that are of the same species, you know, you're going to need more uh, space between plants and, and between rows to ensure adequate airflow. And you want, might even want to be thinking about how you orient your rows uh, so that air can flow, uh, you know, wind can blow between the plants and provide airflow really trying to make sure that the um you know especially if you live in a place where you get you know either uh you know summer rains or you know dew in the morning that you're able to that the plants are able to dry out as quickly as possible to minimize the length of time that they have moisture on them that allows the you know fungal spores to germinate and grow um, you'll be wanting to think about managing crop residue and alternate hosts for those fungal diseases. So keeping, you know, clean fields and, and, and a clean farm, um, those are important things. Practicing very good crop rotations. I know that there's been some, you know, recent research just more generally, not just for seed crops, but, you know, looking that, you know, successful organic farmers are finding that, you know, the, the rotations that are required, you know, they're often looking at more like, you know, six or seven years between you know rotating back into a family on a given crop family on a given piece of land to try and reduce the um, you know the soil borne you know uh you know fungal and other you know pest and disease load within uh, a given field so those are some of the the strategies that exist that are pretty generic and then you know for for specific diseases and specific crops we'll cover some of that in the webinar and some of that's available in that um Seed, uh, the the online um, seed resource guide that eOrganic has. There's also some um, within the there's a a seed production course that eOrganic hosts, and within that there's a module on uh, seed borne diseases that Jody Lou Smith from High Mowing um, provided the content for, and that goes through some of the kind of real key both bacterial and fungal um, diseases that are um, high uh, risk, um, and how to manage them. Yeah. Um, I would just add, oh, sorry. Go ahead, McKenna. Just add to that, uh, very quickly. One other cultural practice would be to avoid overhead irrigation with seed crops. That is another difference between vegetable and seed production practices that are best recommended in terms of disease management, because it's such a long season crop and you don't want to be getting wetting on the seed itself. I'd also say, know your crop and know what the specific um, high risk fungal diseases are that Jared just mentioned and then uh, find out whether or not those are also seed borne and ensure that you're starting with disease free seeds so that it's not being um, planted along with the crop and if in doubt ask the seed company you're contracting with whether or not they have treated or um, at least tested the stock seed that they give you if it's supplied by them for the seed production. Okay, well, we are unfortunately out of time, but we will have the chance to discuss these and many other aspects of organic seed production in the other webinars in this series. And if you've signed up once, you'll get the notification about the other ones, and you don't need to register again for those. And um, you're welcome to watch any of the recorded webinars from last year in both English and Spanish. And um, eOrganic and the Organic Seed Alliance websites both have a wealth of information on organic seed production. So I definitely encourage everyone to take a look at those. So thank you so much, um, everyone. And thanks for all your questions. And we hope to see you next month.